Until 1818, we thought that there was no life at the bottom of our oceans because no organism could withstand all the pressure, low oxygen levels and cold. There was no apparent reason why any creature could adapt to living in the darkness at the bottom of the earth, instead of finding a place in the vast expanses of the oceans. Today we know that there is a wealth of life at the bottom of the oceans, especially at volcanic spots. This brings to mind the question of which else extraordinary spots could be inhabited. Now we keep our eyes upwards and we're determined to meet the neighbours. There are several criteria for life to exist on a celestial body. Living organisms need an environment which contains at least six basic elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, sulfur and phosphorus. Therefore, chemical evolution begins first, and through abiogenesis the transition from non-living to living beings begins. In order to achieve this transition, these elements must be cycled in some way. For example, tectonic activities can fulfill this condition by creating heat and pressure fluctuations. Life needs also a source of energy to nourish itself. This energy source can be external or internal to the celestial body. In our planet, around hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor where magma is discharged, some bacteria can convert the heat and chemical reactions there into food by chemosynthesis. Another example is plants. They eat sunlight, which comes from external energy source. Herbivores eat plants. Carnivores eat herbivores and a food chain is formed. Liquid water can also be counted as a criteria. It is a good solvent, which makes the environment favourable for chemical reactions. Water has another role beside this. Water retains heat, thus preventing the temperature differences in the surroundings from being extreme. Stability is important for the survival of life forms and water can provide this. Each life form can withstand a certain amount of heat radiation pressure on the scale of the conditions in which it evolved. For example, the daytime temperature on the moon is about 121 degrees Celsius and at night it is minus 133 degrees Celsius. It would be difficult for life to develop by adapting to such a wide range of conditions. Atmosphere can also be a criterion. It maintains a pressure balance and protects the celestial body from excess massive radiation. It is also useful to have the magnetic field of the celestial body in order to be protected from radiation. Having a magnetic field also acts as a defense mechanism to prevent asteroids from striking life. Not all places that fulfill these conditions are inhabited, but the place where life is sought must fulfill at least these requirements. We're here because our planet has given us these opportunities. But even this place is not 100% suitable for life as it is. We have already discovered long ago that there are places outside our solar system that are much more suitable for life. But unfortunately, we do not yet have the technology to take us there in an acceptable time frame. According to Fermi Paradox, the known size and age of the universe requires the existence of many technologically advanced extraterrestrial civilizations. But how far could life come somewhere else? To put it simply, why don't they come? If they come, for what purpose? Maybe they didn't even realize we are here, because from a distance our Earth is not even a place where you would expect to find life. Let's keep looking in our reach, in our solar system. Even if there is no second planet in our solar system that can fulfill the conditions I have listed for the formation of life, our neighbours may be locals of a moon. While Mercury has no moons, Saturn has 146 moons. This is the question of how far a celestial body can bend space-time in relation to its own volume and the distance to the star around which it orbits. In other words, we are looking for a moon that contains certain elements, has a magnetic field and atmosphere, contains liquid water, can receive some energy from the sun, but is not at the bottom of the sun and is volcanically active. Although there are many moons near us that fit this description, 
We did not take it very seriously as we thought that water in them was not in liquid form but in ice. Frozen water cannot fulfill the conditions that liquid water can. One of the moons we didn't much care for was Jupiter's Europa. The Hubble Space Telescope has detected clouds of water vapor similar to those observed on Saturn's moon Enceladus, thought to have originated from exploding frozen surfaces. This raised the question of maybe? And we examined the region more closely with the James Webb Space Telescope, a product of much more advanced technology. Vapor would indicate the presence of liquid water. Also, the scratches on Europa was caused by liquid water. Europa was under the intense gravitational pull of massive planet Jupiter and was experiencing gigantic tides due to this gravitational pull. The liquid water at the bottom was being pulled upwards by this attraction and the ice on the top layer was cracking and cracking because of those tides. The meteor trails that we see on most celestial bodies were absent here. Where were the traces of such an attack, which were clearly visible on the surface of the Our Moon and other celestial bodies? With all celestial bodies being bombarded by meteorites, there was no way Europa could have been spared from this invasion. It had no mechanism tough enough to protect itself from meteorites. In other words, the meteorite tracks on the ice layer, which is about 30 kilometers thick, were probably erased by the hot water spewing from the geysers upwards. When we calculate, we estimate that there is an ocean about 100 kilometers deep under this frozen layer. The presence of geysers was evidence of a hot inner core and therefore of tectonic activity and the presence of a magnetic field. Even though it is even smaller than our moon, we discovered that it has a very thin atmosphere, contrary to our first assumption that it couldn't have one. It was screaming, I am alive. Note that the temperature on this satellite, which fulfills most of the criteria for life at this point, is still minus 160 degrees Celsius. But not every part of this satellite had to be habitable for life to begin. It is expected that the temperature under the frozen layer would already be higher. Life could exist in relatively warmer spots near the geysers. The most convincing observation that suggests there is life here was made by the James Webb Space Telescope. The telescope has detected carbon dioxide gas leaking from Europa. We know that if there is carbon dioxide, there is carbon, and carbon is the fundamental building material of life forms like us. The fact that the carbon dioxide coming out of here is mobile makes it very, very likely that there is life here. Life here could be at the microscopic level, or we could encounter gigantic beings. NASA will send the Europa Clipper spacecraft to Europa with a Falcon Heavy rocket on October 2024. We could make more observations if we sent a probe to get a closer look, but even Europa Clipper will answer many questions for us. When the expected discovery is made, human missions will be organized. After all, if life can flourish even here, considering the age and size of the universe, imagine how many civilizations it has been the grave of how many civilizations it will be the home of and what is now inhabiting it. If any life at any level is found on Europa, it will be irrefutable proof that we are not alone in the vast universe. And I hope our lifetime here is long enough to see it. What do you think about this? How will your view of the universe and yourself change if life is found. Let's meet in the comments. See you again. Until then, all the best.